Thanks for tuning in today. Welcome back to our video series on retirement basics. My name is Greg Parker with Engrave Wealth Partners. And in this video, we want to talk specifically about the tax problem in retirement and how we can help you build a tax efficient stream of retirement income. In the first video, we showed you how retirement is rigged against you and where the tax problem comes from specifically. In this video, we want to build out how a retirement income can be constructed in such a way to minimize taxes for you. We can help you build that strategy and monitor it on an ongoing basis to accommodate for changes in your retirement needs, as well as changes in the general tax laws. Looking specifically at where that problem comes from, I think it's important to recognize, again, those three most important things. When it comes to planning for your retirement, we want to consider the impact of where your retirement income comes from, how a portfolio can be invested, and very specifically what the tax implications are for each of those two things. Folks, when most people look at retirement, they're absolutely forgetting about that third thing, taxes. We want to incorporate tax planning into everything that we do for your retirement. So where does your retirement begin? Most of you are aware that in your working years, you have multiple sources potentially for building retirement savings. Some of you are going to have access to a company pension plan. Most of you have access to a 401k savings plan. And some of you will also have access to what we call supplemental retirement plan benefits, such as restricted stock units or RSUs as well as supplemental pension plans. We want to consider all of these when it comes to generating a retirement income because each one of them is going to have individual characteristics that will make a difference when it comes to your taxes. So let's assume that retirement happens and you want to know where does everything go? Well, in a normal situation, you'll have some decisions to make that will likely include the options for three different types of retirement accounts. One might simply be an IRA rollover. IRA rollovers would be in your individual name where you can choose certain beneficiaries that would receive the assets if something happens to you. We also have the opportunity for individual or joint brokerage accounts. Those brokerage accounts typically are after-tax accounts and again, have the opportunity for you to name yourself and or a joint owner, but also have plans for where the assets should go if something happens to you. Finally, we also have the Roth IRA. The Roth IRA is a very unique type of retirement planning vehicle that you need to know about. And we're gonna talk specifically today about the benefits of a Roth IRA relative to everything else. A Roth IRA, like a regular IRA, is named in your individual name with the opportunity to designate certain beneficiaries. So at the time of retirement, you are going to have some choices to make. We will help walk you through those decisions, but the choices begin with a pension. If you have access to a company pension plan, you very likely have options on how to receive that pension. Most companies give you a choice of taking an annuity, which is going to be a stream of ordinary income received every month most of the time direct deposited to your bank account, just like a paycheck. And that annuity is going to be good for the rest of your life or the rest of you and a joint owner's life, depending upon how you choose it. Be sure to tune into our next video where we're gonna dive into the details of the benefits of taking an annuity or taking a lump sum payment. That video will talk about the nuances of each decision and where it makes sense for you to think about. We also have the option here for taking your pension as a lump sum distribution. Now, as the name implies, what it basically means is instead of taking that series of payments over the rest of your life, you're choosing to take all of the pension benefit in one lump sum distribution at the time of retirement or shortly thereafter. The benefit of the lump sum pension, as we'll talk about in the next video, is the ability to roll it into an IRA. Now, why would that matter and why would you care? Well, it's extremely important because when you understand the benefit of a lump sum distribution's tax implications, rolling that lump sum into an IRA rollover means that you can continue to defer any taxes that would otherwise be due on your pension. Putting the money into an IRA simply transfers it from the pension into an individual retirement account, 
that is going to be in your name and you continue to defer the taxes. The deferral of taxes on a pension lump sum is extremely important when we think about the long-term tax implications of your plan. Most of you probably are aware that a 401k savings plan can also be rolled over into an IRA. The idea of moving a 401k into an IRA is not an automatic decision. It's one that you need to consider carefully, but the benefits of rolling a 401k into an IRA include the continued deferment of taxes due. In other words, while the money's invested in the 401k, you are not having to pay taxes on any earnings within the 401k itself. You might have dividends, capital gains, uh, or other forms of interest income that you're receiving each year that you do not need to pay taxes on as long as it's in the 401k. If you roll the money into an IRA, you get to continue those benefits. The taxes in an IRA are deferred. Any earnings that you receive in that IRA can continue to be built upon in the account, and you don't have to pay taxes until you withdraw the funds from the IRA. Now, there's a dotted line here for a specific reason. Rolling the money from the 401k into an IRA in its entirety is not an automatic given situation. It depends on various factors in your 401k. For example, perhaps you're one of those who have been purchasing your company stock inside the 401k savings plan over these years. If that's the case, you need to slow down, not automatically roll everything into the IRA, and consider your options for NUA. Now, NUA might be a foreign concept to you, but it is simply an IRS provision that stands for net unrealized appreciation. And what it basically means is that any appreciation of that stock from where you bought it might have some tax benefits for you if we consider using this IRS provision. Essentially, what NUA allows you to do is to move money directly from a 401k savings plan out of the plan into an after-tax individual or joint brokerage account. You do not need to sell the stock for this to happen. You simply transfer the shares from one account to the other. The benefit is in the taxation. If you exercise NUA on your company stock, the benefit is that the only taxes you'll pay at the time of retirement are taxes on the cost basis of that stock. The gain from the cost basis, what you paid for the stock, to today's market value is deferred until you actually sell the stock. You may not ever sell the stock. You may decide to pass the stock on to heirs. You may decide to just hold on to it indefinitely. But if you do sell the stock in your after-tax brokerage account, that tax that applies to the sale of stock would be long-term capital gains, which is normally a lower tax rate. That could be a tremendous tax savings opportunity. In fact, it's so significant, we've dedicated an entire video to talking about NUA and the tax benefits of it. Look for Retirement Basics number four, NUA and the tax savings opportunity. NUA is a tremendous opportunity, but it's only a one-time opportunity. If you miss it at the time of distribution from your 401k, you cannot go back and redo it. So it's important to consider that before you roll over the 401k and know what your options are. Keep in mind within UA, many financial advisors and even some tax advisors don't know the rules completely, and therefore they tend to avoid taking advantage of NUA. Besides, there could be a conflict of interest here. Some financial advisors would want you simply to sell all of the stock in the 401k so that you can diversify and move that money into an IRA where they can charge you a fee for managing the entire portfolio. Folks, be careful about that. Consider your options carefully when it comes to NUA. Tune into video number four and then talk to us about your specific plan. We'll take advantage of the tax professionals at our firm and our CFP individuals to talk to you about the benefits of NUA and what you need to consider. One last option on the 401k. I know many of you have been very prolific savers. The IRS allows you to save a given amount into a 401k every year pre-tax. What that means simply is if you direct some of your income from your paycheck directly to the 401k, the IRS does not count that income in your taxable income for the year. But they don't make you stop contributing to a 401k at that level. In fact, many individuals continue to contribute over and above the pre-tax levels into their 401k plan.
If you're not sure about this, or if you're not sure if you've been doing this in the past, you can generally look at your 401k statement. And usually somewhere down the page around page two or three, you're going to find a line item that says post 1986 after tax contributions. After tax contributions are commonly abbreviated as ATC. Those after tax contributions simply mean this. That's money that you've invested into a 401k plan, but you already paid taxes on the original investment. Folks, it's important you keep track of that. And here's why. The IRS does not require you to pay taxes twice on the same income. You are allowed to keep track of that original investment into the 401k and not pay taxes on it again. Only the earnings on those contributions would be taxed. Now, what most people do with after-tax money is they simply combine it with everything else and they roll it into the IRA. The problem with that is now you have to keep track of those original after-tax contributions in your IRA. And over the years, while you're withdrawing from your IRA, you have to report to the IRS that these were after-tax contributions, therefore they're not taxable. Folks, I'm going to tell you right now that better than 90% of people absolutely forget to report that and they end up paying taxes twice on the same money. Don't do that. There's no reason to roll those after-tax contributions into an IRA when the IRS allows you to move after-tax contributions directly into a Roth IRA. Now, there's a number of benefits to that. We're going to talk about those, but you need to know the benefits of moving that money to the Roth IRA. A Roth IRA consists of after-tax contributions only. There is no pre-tax money. So everything in your Roth is either after-tax contributions or earnings, and there are tax benefits to both that you need to know about. Before we talk about that, let's address this other potential source of retirement savings. Many of you, based on performance or longevity, have earned the right to receive restricted stock units, RSUs. Normally, this is in the form of a stock grant given to you with a vesting schedule. And the vesting schedules vary depending upon the company, might be three years, might be four years, but generally the way restricted stock units work is the company keeps a record of those stock units when they're granted, and once they vest, they automatically deposit them into an after-tax brokerage account for your benefit. One quick thing you need to know about that, though, is when those deposits are actually made, the company normally is withholding taxes for you. So any tax that might be due on a restricted stock unit is generally taken when the units are vested. Therefore, the net proceeds that you receive in your brokerage account generally have already been taxed and you can now continue to own the stock and not have to pay tax on any original cost basis. Supplemental pension plans operate a little differently and they look different at every company. For this, you probably need to talk to us about what the nature of your supplemental pension plan is but it carries the same tax rules, which basically states that it is taxable when vested. Here's the problem with supplemental pension. For most companies, the vesting date on your supplemental pension coincides with your date of retirement. The date of retirement means that you are going to vest in the entire balance of your supplemental pension. For some of you, that supplemental pension balance is quite large, which could literally add multiple figures of income into your taxable year of retirement. Folks, that could be a major tax hickey, and there's very few options when it comes to vesting in supplemental pension. One thing to consider if you've got a sizable supplemental pension balance and you're thinking about retiring towards the end of a calendar year, it could be to your advantage to think about pushing your date of retirement into the very beginning of the next year, meaning that that supplemental pension gets pushed into a new tax year. Folks, those are very individualized decisions. Please visit with us before you make that decision because there's some things you really need to think about in the big picture of planning out taxes in the year of retirement. All right, so now we've retired and our monies are split between potentially three different accounts. Again, the IRA, the brokerage account, and the Roth IRA. Now, other than looking pretty on the screen here, why have I chosen to color code each of the different buckets? Well, very simply put, the color coding helps me denote the tax implications of taking money from each account. In other words, you've come to retirement and you've said, I need to receive this amount of money per month to provide for my retirement needs. Where do you want to take the money from? 
Well, as we've already alluded to, if we choose to take your retirement income from an IRA, the entire distribution from an IRA, however much you need, is going to be taxed as ordinary income. Refresher back to video number one, what is ordinary income? According to the IRS, ordinary income is the same type of income as salary and wages. It's the income that gets applied to the marginal bracket system. The more you take, the more taxes you'll pay. Any distribution from an IRA is ordinary income. Well, what if I've got an investment that pays dividends? Don't I get qualified dividends from an IRA? Unfortunately not. Any investment in an IRA is subject to ordinary income rules. That's what makes the IRA the least tax-friendly investment for retirement income. Now, I know in many cases we don't have many choices, but that's why planning is so important at this stage. What if I take money out of my after-tax brokerage account? Again, maybe some of my company stock is in there generating qualified dividends. Well, that could be a good idea. In fact, generally, any income coming from an after-tax brokerage account is going to be considered uh, tax preferred. Now, that's a weird term. What does tax preferred mean? Well, it simply means the tax generated off that income depends upon how the money was invested. For example, let's say you've invested your portfolio in a series of municipal bonds. Those are simply bonds issued by state and local governments. But those bonds have interest payments that are federally tax exempt. Therefore, any income we take off of your municipal bonds could be federally tax free. State tax rules still might apply, depends on where you live, but the federal tax exemption makes those extremely appealing. Why wouldn't everybody just use municipal bonds in their uh, individual or after-tax brokerage accounts? Well, unfortunately, interest rates are very low right now, and it's hard to generate enough income off of municipal bonds alone. That means we need to think about other options. Maybe we're going to consider investing in stocks that pay qualified dividends. Again, qualified dividends are not tax-free, but they enjoy preferential treatment usually maxing out around a 15% marginal tax bracket, up to 20% if you're in the highest marginal bracket. But the bottom line is, qualified dividends, long-term capital gains, and other tax-preferred vehicles could give us an advantage inside of an after-tax brokerage account that means you could pay less on that income than what you're paying on distributions from the IRA. Finally, the Roth IRA, and I think most of you are probably aware of this, but the Roth IRA has the potential to generate tax-free income. Now, there are some nuances you need to know about a Roth IRA here, and this is something I think is important and worth listening to. When you think about the tax-free income off of a Roth IRA, what you need to know is that any contributions you've put into a Roth IRA are always going to be tax-free. Again, as I stated, the contributions were taxed when you received the income. Therefore, you can always pull your contributions without paying additional taxes. However, the earnings in a Roth IRA are not necessarily tax-free until you've met two criteria or qualifications. Number one, for a Roth IRA to generate tax-free earnings, you must be over the age of 59 and a half and have owned a Roth IRA for at least five calendar years. Now, what does that mean, five calendar years? Well, the IRS doesn't look at days or uh, months necessarily. They simply look at the year that you created a Roth IRA. So if you created a Roth IRA back in 2005, forgot about it, maybe it's sitting over at the bank growing, you have met the five-year qualification for Roth IRAs. Well, what if you open up a new Roth IRA after that somewhere else? It doesn't matter. The IRS only looks at the original Roth IRA that you opened. And as long as the five calendar years have been met and you're over 59 and a half, the income off of that, of those earnings are tax free. Now, it's important to understand for a Roth IRA, if you've never had one before, there is an excellent time to set one up today. Get it started now so that that five-year clock starts for you. If you set up a Roth IRA in 2022, the first point at which you're eligible for tax-free earnings would be January 1st of 2027, assuming you're over the age of 59 and a half. The five calendar year thing does not care about months or days, just the year it was established. Anything created in the year of 2022 is eligible January 1st for withdrawal, tax-free earnings, as long as you're over 59 and a half. One important point, I run across this very frequently with a lot of corporate professionals. They say, well, I've got a Roth 401k going and therefore my five-year clock has been met. 
Folks, I'm sorry to tell you that that's not the case. The IRS rule is very specific that a Roth 401k is not the same thing as a Roth IRA. They have unique and individual five-year clocks. If you've got a Roth 401k working at the company, building up and growing, you decide to retire and roll that into a Roth IRA at retirement, your five-year clock starts over unless you've had a pre-existing Roth IRA. Even if you're using the Roth 401k at work, I strongly recommend setting up a Roth IRA so that that five-year clock gets started. Now, some of you say, well, wait a minute, aren't there contribution limits and rules about opening a new Roth IRA? That's correct, there are. You can only put a certain amount of money per year into a Roth IRA, but the real nuance about Roth IRAs is in order to open one, your taxable income must be below a certain threshold. That threshold di differs depending upon whether you're single, married filing jointly, or filing as a head of household. But generally, married filing joint starts to phase you out of a Roth IRA opening contribution somewhere around total income of $190,000 to $200,000 a year. Folks, if that's the case, give us a call, talk to us about what is known as a backdoor Roth IRA. That's a way that you can still open a Roth IRA if your income is above the limit, but it's extremely tricky and requires some nuances that are very complex. Let us help you with that so that you don't get in some kind of trouble from the IRS. That way we can help you build out that Roth IRA and get that clock started. Now, one last thing uh, before we close this video off. Why in the world have I built the boxes in different sizes here? The bucket for the IRA is much larger than it is for the after-tax brokerage or the Roth IRA. Why would that be the case? Well, unfortunately for most people that we've dealt with, whether they come from various industries or various parts of the country, it tends to be that the majority of their retirement savings are sitting in the pension and the 401k savings plan. That means at retirement, the majority of their retirement income is going to come likely from an IRA. Now, that's not an altogether big problem. We just need to think about how we take the income in retirement and balance it out from a tax perspective. But there's one seed I want to plant in your mind before we finish our time today. And that is traditional financial advice. When you're talking to advisors or when you're reading financial advice on the internet, they're often going to tell you that in the first few years of retirement, you can enjoy some of the lowest tax brackets of your life. Generally speaking, what they're saying is, since your salary is gone, your taxable income is probably going to decline, which is true. What they're not considering, though, is where your retirement income needs to come from. We've seen cases where clients will retire, their salary goes to zero, but to generate enough income, they have to take distributions from the IRA, and they end up generating nearly as much in taxes their first year of retirement as they did when they were working. The other thing is maybe you have gotten a little crafty. You've got some investments over here in a Roth or a brokerage account, or like I said on the last video, maybe you're going to get your income from other sources, uh, doing some consulting work or other investments. There's one thing you need to know. Again, traditional investment advice would say, let's minimize what we take out of the IRA in that first year or two, maximize income we can take from more tax preferred sources so that you can enjoy some extremely low tax years. Now, if you wanna look at it graphically, it's probably gonna look something like this. If your retirement started here in 2022, the blue line represents the amount of retirement income you're gonna take per year with a 2.5% inflation kicker. Now, the key is the green bar below would represent the taxes due. And what they're showing on the bar here is very clearly that your taxes in the first few years of retirement are absolutely gonna be significantly lower than they would have been in your working years. The key, however, is that bump you see there happening in 2031. Again, what I've assumed here is that a retiree at age 62 leaves, goes into retirement, and is gonna live off of other forms of savings or investments for the first 10 years of retirement. But that kick up in the green line that you see is an increase in taxes that comes because of the tax problem we've been talking about. Those are the taxes due from required minimum distributions at age 72. And you can see that those taxes are going to continue to grow in your later years simply because the IRA continues to grow, the distribution amounts get larger and larger according to the IRS calculations, and you find yourself in a tax problem in your 70s, 80s, or 90s. Folks, don't think about that as an unsolvable problem. We have solutions that help think about how do we put together some immediate plans today to take some of those future taxes at higher rates and bring them forward to today at lower rates. 
That's what tax optimization is really all about. And unfortunately, most financial advisors don't do that in retirement. It's a specialty of ours at Engrave Wealth, and it's something we're going to focus on as we think about building out for you a plan that recognizes how can we manage those taxes in a meaningful way that we can pay perhaps a little bit more in the early years without avoid, with avoiding having to pay significantly higher taxes in later years. All of that gets answered, as I said in the last video, using our retirement optimization strategy. Folks, retirement optimization is free of charge. There's no obligation. We can build a plan for you that helps answer the basic questions of retirement, put it in your hands so that you know the decisions you need to make and we can help guide you through those questions. To build the optimization plan, you can simply send us some basic information by going to our website at engravewealth.com. Click the button that says start your free plan, and we'll be glad to get working on that analysis immediately, providing it back to you within 24 to 48 hours using a Zoom meeting or meeting in person. Folks, I thank you for your time today. I hope this video is helpful. Please be sure to tune into the next video where we're going to dive in on that pension decision, annuity versus lump sum and the tax implications of both. Thanks for being here today. Have a great time.